Greetings, friends. I am Matthew Kennedy, licensed professional counselor. You are listening to Experience Emerge. Today, we will dive into another conversation about the broken and fractured aspects of our lives. Then we will discuss how we put these pieces back together again to find rest and live free. C.S. Lewis once said, Miracles are a retelling in small letters of the very same story which is written across the whole world in letters too large for some of us to see. In today's episode, we are going to explore a story in hopes to gain a little bit of perspective on those larger letters. To say we are living in strange times would be an understatement. Over the past few weeks, everything seems to have changed. I'm seeing clients only through the camera of a computer. I haven't seen friends or family in person for what feels like forever. And information just keeps changing by the minute. Sometimes it's hard to find God when crisis takes place. Today, my guest is the associate pastor at a Redemption Chapel in Stowe, Ohio. He joins me via Zoom to share a bit about what pastoring a church looks like during this COVID-19 season. But then he will share the journey he and his wife experienced while trying to grow their family through infertility, miscarriage, and the daunting emotional roller coaster of adoption. Please welcome Pastor Jared Williams. So I am Jared. Uh, been a pastor for about 10 years now. Uh, originally from Pittsburgh. Um, it's funny when I say I'm a pastor now, for much of my life, I didn't even know what that meant or what that looked like. Even still today, I was raised Catholic. And so when I tell my family I'm a pastor, the most common response is, well, is that, is that kind of like a priest? Well, I don't know. You know so, but uh, yeah, I became a pastor like about 10 years ago now, started in youth ministry, went that route like a lot of folks, but I ended up coming over to Kent State. And so it was hard to actually pick a school. I visited Kent State. Um, I had no idea where I wanted to go, but visited Kent State and it was gorgeous, wall to wall sunshine. And I thought, wow, you know, Ohio's so sunny. I should come here. And so I didn't realize, uh, just happened to pick a good day, but man, I, I really, I, I honestly had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And even picking a school was hard. I thought, you know, I'd want to be a lawyer, so I'd pick a good law school. But man, I, I really, I filled out the application on a whim because I didn't know, well, they didn't make me fill out an essay. So, all right, well, Kent. And so I applied and early on, I knew that I would want to work with people. I mean, in the end, my dad waterproofed basements and that's what I did through high school, you know, filling up buckets, digging trenches and, you know, obviously wonderful work. And, you know, I'm grateful for how it provided for my family and that work. But I ultimately knew like I wanted to work with people and not just provide a service that way. So I went into psychology and then that was kind of my undergrad, did psych work and then studied psychology and through that got involved in ministry uh, at Kent State, you know, Camps Crusade for Christ. We called it the dive back then. And from then, man, my world just kind of completely flipped of what I wanted to do. And it was actually the chapel in Akron. Um, I ended up, it was so cool. This was a total God thing. I interviewed a guy for five minutes because we were, hey, we're a ministry, but you should get plugged into a church. And I interviewed a guy for like five minutes, didn't know him at all. And I get a call from him two years later. Hey, you know, this is Brian Kunkler. I was wondering maybe if God couldn't use me to open up some doors. And I totally, you know, random and, but we ended up connecting and uh, he offered an internship at the chapel to get seminary work, you know, to get mm. seminary studies, but then also work with college ministry. And from there, I thought if I could do this with my life, like there's nothing else I'd rather do. And so kind of ended up working at the chapel. And then through there, once I was done with student ministries, I couldn't eat once the overnights and I can only eat so much cheese puffs and cheese balls. <laughs> I thought, all right, I, I got to be done. And so, um, right. wonderful time there. Love those students. And then ended up, uh, where I'm at now at Redemption Chapel. And, and uh, explain a little bit about your role at, at Redemption and, and, and kind of, um, you know, how long you've been there and, and all that stuff. So I'm pretty sure it's, uh, seven years. They, uh, 
so they were, it's funny, the role has shifted so much. I mean, our church has grown like crazy. And we just did our 10 year anniversary. We started off and I wasn't there right at the launch, but started off with 70 people like 10 years ago. And now we're, you know, like 1500 or some 1400 or something on a Sunday. So it's just been crazy. So I jumped in, you know, about, you know, year three or so if I'm doing the math right. But anyway, it's changed so much. And so my role has shifted, but, uh, so I'm one of the associate pastors. So Rick McKee's the lead pastor. And so when I first got, when it was just the two of us, you know, I had kind of overseas, you know, oversaw groups, you know, men's, women's, you know, missions. So basically every, you know, a lot of the other departments would kind of, I oversaw that. And then as we've grown kind of shifted and specialized. And so now I do a lot of the counseling, um, a lot of the different, um, missions work local and global mm -hmm. and then yeah obviously <laughs> every, every one of our job descriptions has that last bullet point is other duties as a sign so, <laughs> that's right <laughs> we all know what that means and so it's just kind of bad whatever needs done so and like a lot of membership baptism a lot of the yeah. classes like that i oversee yeah and i know with your your psych background and, and the, the counseling you do that's been a a big part of your and my connection and and and, and being able to um uh, talk a lot about uh, those types of things. So, uh, Jared, I'd like to talk about a little bit in this climate, like what what is going on in the church with uh, the COVID nineteen, and, and how is it affecting you as a pastor? And just uh, share a little bit about um, what you guys are experiencing. Well, man, I mean, it really is just like check the day, right? Like, because as far as one of the hardest things that's happened in real time, you know, I mean, yeah. every day it's changing and evolving and how long does it last? So one of it, I mean, that's one of the big parts of the burden is it's kind of happening in real time and it's shifting the climate changes every day. But I can tell you this, like one of the big burdens, this is something we've kind of grieved a little bit as pastors because I mean, you hear a lot of talk of nine 11, right? That's probably one of the biggest comparable experiences that, so impacting everybody and oftentimes in these crises people you know can be more open to god more open to spirituality like we question mortality you know and we get what are our priorities so that almost that happens almost without fail so we're in that situation where people are probably more open to god and we can't meet and it's just that's yeah. one of the most difficult things people now are looking for god open to god but yet you know, it's that much harder to reach people. So, I mean, like everybody else, we're reinventing, you know, we think of, you know, the principle and practice, right? So principle doesn't change, but the practice looks different. Like we don't meet like they do in the early church in a lot of ways, you know, I mean, some of the practices will look different. You know, we have buildings yeah. now, we're in houses and that's okay. But as long yeah. as the principle is there of okay, community and connecting with God, but as the practice, what it looks like now is just going crazy and you know everybody's trying to reinvent man how do we meet virtually trying yeah. to still stick to okay the principle is the same god is here with us we can still know him grow in him and go serve him those are our values no grow go and you know still doing that but man it's just a wild climate and you know as, yeah. as it looks different every day yeah, I mean, you make a great point, and 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 I know in in my spiritual walk and and my uh, uh, journey in coming to know the Lord, it was about connectivity. It was about guys that that were really breathing life into me, and and we were connected. And that's so true. It's it's it looks very different right now. Yeah, and I feel the pressure of it. It's you know, <laughs> man, it's weird to be in one of those moments, knowing that as we sit here today, we're gonna remember this week these weeks for the rest of our lives right like just like i can t i you know you could i'm sure tell me exactly where you were when the planes hit on 9 11 yeah, for sure and so it's weird to be sitting here knowing like wow i'm gonna talk about this for the rest of my life and i and some of that like all right i want to do the right thing and it's weird they're like you know i hear from the doctors like be a hero binge on netflix <laughs> okay okay i think i can do that but it's right you know, i want to you hear those times right like where the church shines in darkness and the light, you know, shines bright in the darkness. And so and I probably, you know, un, unneeded feel just that pressure of like, okay, how do we I think of, you know, one of the plagues, I don't know exactly what it was, but 
the quote always comes to mind that, you know, all of the best priests died of that time, you know, and all that. And it just that idea that they, they were engaging, but yet, man, I don't want to put anybody in danger. You know, I don't want to unnecessarily spread right. this. And so it's, it's just tricky. I just feel a lot of that pressure, man, how does the church shine in times where we got to be so, you know, socially distant. And I like this too. It's somebody said it and is right. It's physically distant, not socially distant. So you think like social media, that's how we connect. And even so many, it's virtual. Yeah. We don't have to be socially distant. Like we're connecting right now. That, that's right. Physically distant, not socially distant. And I, that helped me here in that. Yeah. Well, you know, when I was putting together the, the seasons, uh, the first season, uh, I wasn't thinking about, you know, uh, COVID-19. So, I mean, um, the reason I, I wanted to uh, have you on the podcast is, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting in church and you were preaching and you had shared um, your and Molly's story of um, just, uh, well, I don't, I don't even want to start it because I want to give you the opportunity to share it. But I, I've heard you and I've talked about this uh, before and you know, you know that this is something that hits really close to my wife and, and, and my heart. And, and we, you know, weren't had our own journey, but I'd love to give you some, some time to just share your journey that, that you and Molly um, experienced in. Um, yeah. If you, if you would. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we're coming up on our 10 year anniversary as well. And yeah, so, but you know, 10 years ago now we, didn't want to have kids right away. We, you know, wanted to travel, do a lot of that fun stuff. And so we, it's, it's funny as we're home so much, we're looking through photographs. I saw we, you know, took a baby moon to Europe and looking through like all our, you know, we got nothing else to do. We're sitting home looking through old pictures and stuff. And mm -hmm. so it's fun thinking of that season of life, you know, before kids and, you know, the carefree aspect of that. But like everybody, well, not, I said that way too strong. Like most people, you know, get to that place where, you know, desiring to grow your family. I always, I always say, it sounds weird when people say start a family. Like, you're a family with a husband and wife. Like, right. I don't know. That, I think that starts before kids. Even that, we tip right. our hands. That, like, we can almost be idolatrous towards kids. Like, you don't have a family until you have kids. So that is <laughs> That's right. true at all. But, but anyway, we I try to say grow a family, and we wanted to grow our family. Um, so we kind of starting down that road. And it's so funny how many things just naive in life. You know, I. I didn't understand how having a baby worked. I understand the general, you know, but <laughs> how, how difficult it is. Like you did, I didn't realize how many people had trouble, you know, getting pregnant and all of that. And so it's just interesting. Um, you know, so we were trying and, you know, we got pregnant and through that, um, and again, this was kind of shocking to me, the journey, you know, we had a miscarriage and, part of that part of the thing that was shocking for me is it seems so common right like and you, you don't know people don't talk about it a ton and then you have a miscarriage and you find out and everybody and their mother had one and here's the mistake I made that just because it's common doesn't mean it's not traumatic and I assumed oh this is so common everybody does this this must not be that big of a deal mm -hmm. and I get everybody's journey even with miscarriages it's different but and we had a miscarriage and that was a difficult time, you know, for you know, our marriage, just personally wrestling through it. It was, it was wild. And it really took me aback. Like I didn't expect that for sure. Um, how difficult that was going to be. And part of it, this is one of the things I learned so much and even in marriages is, you know, and it makes sense saying it now, but as a husband and wife, you're going to process that differently. I don't know why I assumed that, you know, everybody processes grief the same in the same rate and in the same way, but man, we didn't. And that was, you know, that was really difficult. And then you kind of get through that. Um, we got pregnant again and had our, uh, our first daughter, Gwen. So wonderful blessing, you know, so excited for that. Um, but we, you know, at that point, we're still thinking like, man, we were surprised how close we were to stopping with one because mm -hmm. having kids was way more difficult than I thought. <laughs> and parenting is not easy. And sure. I think we were both, I loved, you, you watch Parenthood? You watch that show? Oh, though? sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love me some Parenthood. And I loved, I love that picture, you know, of sitting around 
we wouldn't sit outside because I think that was like filmed in California, but you know, they'd always have dinner outside and he's like, you know, 20 people dinners. I, I love that idea of a massive family, mm-hmm. but you got to pay the price to raise <laughs> nine kids to get there. It is. But anyway, we were surprised how much we might've been okay with one. And then we thought, no, we, 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 you know, God willing, love to have more got pregnant again. And then had a, another miscarriage and it was just, it was really weighing on us and it was difficult. And at that point we thought, man, we want, we definitely wanted to adopt. That's something that God has laid on our heart, you know, all along. But through that, we, you know, our will, our plan, we thought that was going to happen down the road, you know, whatever biological kids we were hoping to have, have those and then, um, then adopt. But and God and his timing was uh, revealing, kind of had some different plans for us. And we were trying to be good of, of just surrendering to that. Like, man, God, we thought this is what you, and it's not like we were being disobedient, right? It's not like, God, we thought we'd be drug dealers and you want us to go in ministry. Like, that's not <laughs> right. what we're dealing with. Like, God, we thought, you know, we were being, you know, trying to honor you with having more kids. And, um, and so through that, it, you know, just kind of became clear, man, in God's timing, I, I think we, we should just, you know, start that journey of adoption um, now. So we had one kid and, you know, what weren't getting any younger along the way. And so we started down that road and it is a wild roller coaster. I mean, I mean, I don't know how many people you know that have adopted, but I mean, roller coaster is the go-to illustration and everybody relates to it instantly. Like, there's so many ups and downs of that journey. And so you, you're waiting to get matched. You know, you put yourself out there and I don't know how every agency does it, but we make a book and it's kind of funny. They're like, you know, just be yourself in the book. And it's hard to like, Hey, look how perfect my family is. Pick (laughs) us, you know, like, you know, let's, you know, let's put a piano in there. What if they hate pianos? Don't put a piano in there. You know, like (laughs) uh, just this wild, that's where the, just be yourself. You can't, I can't manipulate this. I don't know, you know, what a birth mom's going through. And so we, we threw our book out there. Um, and I forget the exact, how long we were waiting, you know, you get these emails, well, your book's being shown to somebody and you just pray and wig out and pray some more. And, and then finally we got the point where, um, somebody wanted to meet us. We were, you know, matched or close Mm -hmm. to matched at that point. And that is a wild journey. We, um, you just go meet the birth mom picks. We went to Red Lobster, which normally I'd love to just bash on some cheddar biscuits, but man, my stomach's turning, you know, it is, it is weird to meet an utter stranger knowing this, you know, this person will radically, you know, alter your life and you don't, you know, open adoption is becoming more and more prevalent. So you could have, um, you know, more interaction with them, but you know, by large, this could, this person could be a complete stranger. And so we, um, yeah, it's just weird to sit down and have, you know, a meal with this person. So we, um, sit down and that goes well. And one of the hardest parts to process through this is as we got matched, we, you know, finding out that, you know, that child, we were, you know, friends with, the biological sibling of that child. And this is one of the hardest things, right? Is discerning what is God's will. I mean, this just seemed like one of those times the stars aligning, like surely, you know, with this, this was God's will. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things along the way is everybody, you know, you could be matched with somebody that's already a family that the child's already born, or they just got pregnant. And she was, if I remember right, I think like three months pregnant. So we had six months. So we were matched for six months and, you know, every day just praying, you know, along the way, praying for that child and, you know, every day praying for that birth mom and we'd have some interactions. And so, you know, it's weird too. Like, what do you do? Like along the way, I remember our community group, you know, surprised us, you know, with a baby shower. Right. And this is, you know, something that you have biological child we'd always do, but no, this is, we're welcoming a child into our family. Let's have a baby shower. And, you know, we named the baby and we, you know, got ready and we were so excited. And this totally seemed like, man, this is God's will for our family. I mean, I, 
you know, as, as convinced as I could be. And we were getting excited as the time came. And, um, you know, just before due date, you know, all of a sudden just radio silence, we stop hearing mm. from the birth mom. And, and again, it's a, it's a roller coaster of a process. It's not like we're neighbors. It's not like we're calling every day. So it, you, you have, really don't know what's going on. And so we kind of waited, reached out and we, you know, there's, you know, caseworkers involved. And so I think it was about three weeks before the due date, we hear nothing. And so just, you know, of course, like, God, what is going on? Like, is this not like what you led us to do? And we didn't hear, you know, and we just, it was, we were completely just ghosted and you know, really struggling through that time. I mean, just devastated. I mean, it, you know, it's not like, you know, we were going to buy a new car and they didn't have the color car we went. I mean, this is, this is our family. This is, you know, a child. This was our daughter that we prayed for daily for six months and just really just wrecked throughout it. I mean, we wrestled and wrestled and I shared that, you know, shared this recently, but it was, you know, at one of the lowest times I remember, you know, just getting in my car and turning, turning the key. And it was one of those, again, it just seemed like, you know, we like to call them God winks. Those times where God just reminding us like, Hey, I know it feels crazy. I'm still here. Like I'm with you in this. And as I turned that key, like I said, the, the timing couldn't be more perfect. I mean, the next line of that, that I hear the song was just starting and it was, I don't understand. And in that moment, I know, okay, God, you're talking to me. Like, cause I'm right in that place. Like, God, I don't understand. Like what is happening? And it, even the song kept going. Like, you know, I, I'm only here because I thought this was a part of your plan, you know? And at that point, you know, I'm, I'm about like four bars into the song and I'm just, you know, bawling. Cause it was just so clearly God ministering to my soul and in, in one of the lowest points. And the song was thy will be done and it just god was you know slowly i think of an old song it says break these chains but break them slowly you know like they, i mean this was something that i i wanted so desperately and i couldn't free myself from it was god just slowly just kind of softening my heart like you get almost here god turning the key of those chains and them falling because it was okay like i knew what i had to do in that moment like I couldn't give it up. Like this was something that I wanted so desperately. And God was just saying like, you know, will you trust me? You know, will you, you know, release this to me? And I, uh, that kind of started me on that journey. And I, I don't know if you ever go to Stan Hewitt, but we're Stan Hewitt fans. Um, pretty soon around that time, I went down and I just spent some time with God just all day praying. And I could take you to the bench because it was, real ornate and it for me that was just my altar i mean it was you know an altar that i walked around praying and i just sat down on that bench and i you know yeah, we'll say literally that's not the right word but i mean just figuratively even in my mind i sat there and i just laid my family down on that bench and that was just my altar before god of okay god like this is your family and so i just said if if this is not your will if you don't want us if this isn't the daughter you have for us to raise, it it's your will anyway. If I'm here because I thought that you brought me here, then here you go. And I I kind of laid my family, myself included, down on that bench as an altar before the Lord. And I, I walked away with peace that, okay, God, I'm going to trust you no matter what. And it was pretty soon after that um, where we were walking as a family, uh, we got a, a text from that birth mom. And so it was, you know, like, like you're saying, even the craziness is time. It's weird in those emotional times, you remember all the details. Like I, I could take you to the tree I was passing. And when we got the text, I remember just seeing some, you know, you know, my wife's look on her face and, and we talked about the text and we found out that baby uh, dialed in, died in childbirth. And so okay. it was wild for us, you know, even putting it all together our miscarriage, uh, what we found out, and you know, some of this looking back, it was that the same date 
So essentially, we we lost two babies on the same date. You know, the the date we had the doctor's appointment, and the day we got that text for the same date for us. And it was, man, it was interesting because as much as that was emotionally low, I was also at that point more surrendered to God of okay, God, we're going to trust you no matter what. And going through that was crazy. Um, but for us, the craziest part, when you, when you talk about God winks of just being, you know, reminded that God was in it. Because from when we got that text, we got another call a week later that we were matched with a boy. And that boy was a week old. And so we went back at our lowest point when like, we felt like death was reigning in our life, like minutes, hours away, our son was born. So the day that we lost, you know, even, a, you know, emotionally, the day that we found out that news and lost those two babies was the same day our son was born and we just didn't know it. And so it's one of those things that even though like we, we can't see the week ahead, we can't see the future. And so in that darkest moment, you know, like it's almost like God whispering to us, like, I'm still here. There's still a plan. Will you trust me? And it's easy to trust like now, like, oh my gosh, like this is, this is God's plan. My son was born and you know, that Isaac was what God had for us all along, but it's, I mean, the key is in that moment when it, when yeah. nothing seems to make sense, when I can't decipher, you know, God's will from hieroglyphics. I mean, it's crazy. And so there we were in that moment, you know, of man, losing another child on the same day is the yeah. same almost moment our son was born. And my wife actually prayed that as well. Like we couldn't go through the roller coaster and she prayed like, God would like, would the child already be born? I can't handle this. And, you know, it, it was a week later, we got a call that, hey, there's a, there's a baby boy in Youngstown. Wow. And then we went to meet them. And, you know, it was kind of, he was in the NICU for a while. And then we brought him home and just trusting, okay, this is God's will. And so that was, that was our journey to bring in our baby boy home. It was a roller coaster and times unbelievably confusing. Yeah. but just trusting, okay, it's your will. And I don't know the plan you do, and I'm going to trust you along the way. And Jared, that, that story, I mean, it, it gets me choked up every time and I can feel it. <laughs> I can feel it in my chest right now. And, and the, the reason I think that this um, was so important is in the moment and, and my wife and I kind of experienced this too, you just don't understand what's going on. Like what, yeah. where's God at? What's he doing? And yeah. we look back now at that time and, and we can see God moving now in retrospect. And I love hearing your story because I know a lot of people right now who are going through um, just a lot of, uh, you know, confusion and, and anxiety. We're going to look back at this time, this, this, this COVID-19 period, and we're going to go, now we see God moving. And I know that's, that's really difficult for people to see sometimes in the moment. And, um, yeah. and I really, I just, I appreciate you. I, I love you as a pastor and I, I love following you as, as a congregate at our church. And I just, I appreciate it so much. Thanks for, for being on our podcast today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I am, I am happy to share and yeah. I mean, like you said, I think we all need those encouragements because it's easy to, because like you said, somebody, in the thick of the storm, that's the hardest part to believe. I mean, I know somebody's still in that storm. And you know, if I could tell that person that you, even if you can't see it, God is there and God is moving. And I remember, you know, think of, you know, in the Old Testament, people on the wrong side of the river. And I remember just hearing a sermon when I, you know, lost people that I loved and just the key is praising kind of before that miracle, like, okay, God, I'm still gonna praise you even when I don't see it. And that's a difficult thing, but and all this uncertainty, I go back to what I know is certain and that God is there. God loves me. I don't, I don't know much past that, but we can, we can cling to that in the chaos. I would like to thank Pastor Jared for making the time to conference in for this podcast. This was our first time recording XM using a call and not having a guest in the studio, which moving forward seems to be a new norm for a while. 
I want to leave you with this, hope. Jared shared a story with uh, adversity that we can look back on now and see how God was present the whole time. He is now too. Have faith, my friends. Please check out emerge.org for more about the services that we provide and um, feel free to share this podcast with friends and family members. So until next time, or when our Savior comes, God bless.